Hi everybody, my name is Lisa and it's time for another Verbling class and in this hour it will be a reading class. Um, I took an article from the New York Times online and I thought we would read this article and discuss. It is about the idea of using some handheld devices to check uh, people's reaction to Broadway musicals or musicals that want to be on Broadway. So this topic is interesting in the sense that it is part business. So if you are interested in business and marketing and also it's part creative. So if you're interested in the ideas of creativity and art, musicals, acting, theater, uh, stuff like that, then it's really good vocabulary for you if you would like to uh, be able to understand these types of articles and also to be able to uh, discuss them. So I put over here in the Verbling chat uh, the link to a Google document. That's where I have the article and we are going to read it together. So if you have a reservation for the class you can go ahead and use that now and if you don't yet have a reservation I think the reservation button shows up first so you can click on that and then you'll be able to uh, join the class with the green button you just click on join class it costs one ticket and you can uh, get tickets uh, for three dollars per class so that's three dollars for an hour long class or you can buy a couple of tickets in a package deal or you can um, be a premium member. So if you want to become a premium member of Verbling, then it's $45 a month, and that allows you to get um, to take as many classes as you like. So I'm going to give you guys the link here so that everybody can um, see how you get tickets. So there you go. That's how you get tickets. And if you want to... Uh, uh, use PayPal, you can use PayPal now. If you do not have a credit card, you can use PayPal. If you have a PayPal account, um, otherwise, you can just use a credit card. So uh, the Verbaling classes do cost money, but it's a pretty good deal. You get to have an hour-long class uh, for $3, or you get to have uh, as many hour-long classes as you would like if you join with the premium membership. There's classes going on um, most of the time. Usually we try to have a class every hour, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the classes are all different. We have different teachers and we have different topics for the classes. So uh, for example, this is a reading class. So in the reading class you actually get to do a lot of things. You get to listen to me read so you hear pronunciation to see if you can understand then you get to practice uh, your reading and then you also get to practice your speaking because oftentimes we discuss the article and you get to say what you think about the article and what your ideas are so if you want to join then you can join now I do see that there are quite a few people who have opened the document so that's great, but um, nobody has joined me in the Google Hangouts yet, so I'm, I'm wondering if everybody can can see me here in the Google Hangouts. I'm going to just make sure and check on the Verbling page to make sure everything is working okay. So, um, yes, if you guys want, anybody wants to join, then you need to join it now so we, we can get the class started, okay? Otherwise, so we'll just wait here to see if anybody uh, shows up and uh, we can get started. This is going to be um, an intermediate class, so it's not a, a beginner class, it's not a simple reading, but uh, it is uh, it's a good run. It's a New York Times article, so if you are, are wanting to improve your English, especially if you are studying for something like the TOEFL test or the IELTS exam, then this is the type of uh, reading that you want to make sure that you know how to do, that you can read it, and that you can answer uh, questions about it, and that you understand the words. Yes. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. I see some people in the verbling chat. They have their reasons. I totally understand. Mine, uh, if you're at work, it makes it difficult. Um, everybody has different schedules, so that's why verbling tries to have a class every hour so that, you know, if you're in a different time zone or you have to work and then you're only available later, then that's fine. So some hours and sometimes work better for some people than other people. Hi, Hamid. How are you? I'm okay. What about you? Good. Hamid, how did your test go? Uh, my reading uh, essay uh, is uh, a little bit hard for me. Oh, okay. Uh, listening and speaking is so so, uh, mm -hmm. but writing is good. Okay, okay. When when will you have the results? Uh, maybe beginning of July. Okay, so in about a week or something, maybe two weeks. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, I want to ask. Uh, I wrote uh, 210 words uh, for uh, integrated uh, part, and I wrote uh, 325 words for uh -huh. independent essay. Yeah. Uh, are they good? Um, I don't know the number of s. Does it? Did you see on a web page? I'm not sure. Like, uh, how many do they want? Sorry. I think that, uh, so tell me again for the essay, how many words? Uh, for integrated essay, I wrote 210 words, uh, total ones uh, between 150 and 225 words. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, independent essay, uh, total ones, uh, three, uh, minimum 300 uh, words. Yeah. And I wrote uh, 325 words. Okay. Yeah, so that should be great. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how did you feel about it? Did you feel like it... Uh, uh, a little bit nervous uh, and uh, curious. Was it... Did it, uh, did it seem difficult? Uh, some parts are uh, difficult because, uh, you know, I tried to first time. Yes. So uh, the real and uh, other environments are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, did you? Was it difficult because of uh, not understanding the vocabulary that they were using, or what part was difficult for you? Uh, I could be better. I mean this uh, because uh, some parts uh, are difficult because. Um, how can I explain? I could be better uh, because my expectation is uh, uh, was uh, I think myself uh, can I do this exam? Yeah. Uh, but after that, uh, I I am a little bit I uh, a little bit regret for myself. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I could be better. Yeah. So, but do you know what, how you can improve? Like, do you need to learn more words to understand, or uh, what do you think you can get better in? Uh, I understood. Yeah. Uh, for example, in speaking part, uh, I cannot, I could not uh, the make structures. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I could uh, take notes, but I cannot uh, speak. Clearly or uh, structural. Mm, okay. My pro my problem is that. Okay. Did you find that it was uh, very quick when you had to speak? Did it did it go very quickly? Yes, because uh, time is uh, limited. Yes, time is limited. That's right. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just keep working on it then. Let me say uh, hi to uh, Laszlo. Hi, Laszlo. How are you? Hi, Lisa. I'm fine. Thank you. And you? Good. You're a beginner? You don't sound like a beginner. <laughs> yes, yes. My very big problem in, in the speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to be reading, which will help uh, you guys in the speaking as well. And so far, you guys are the only two in the class right now. So we let's get started because it's a little bit of a long article, actually. But I think there's some good uh, vocabulary in there and some ideas. 
that we can uh, talk about. So you guys can open up the the link. Did you guys get the link already, Hamid? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So this is what it's called. It's called dialing up a hit. That's question mark. Dialing up a hit. Influence over musical is in the crowd's hands. All right. So dialing up. Dialing up is when you uh, usually on the uh, old phones you have use used to have to spin your finger on the numbers that was called dialing now dialing uh, means you know on the phones we don't dial we touch it usually if you have an iPhone for example you call somebody you just punch in the numbers but this little device that you see here that these ladies have is a little machine that they are using and that is called a dial right there that little that button and you turn it and you you turn it to tell if you like something or you don't like something and it's it's a way that they're trying to figure out what crowds like so this is part of uh, research and marketing research and some people think it's a good idea and other people think it's not uh, a good idea for artists to, to do this uh, hey. Hi there, Amparo. We have some people joining us. Hi, Amparo, and hi, Donato. Welcome. You guys are just in time. We're going to get started here reading. And we're going to be uh, reading this article together. So I'm going to start. Yes, hi. Hi. How are you? I'm so fine. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, so uh, this is from Portland, Oregon. All right, so I'm going to read first, and then you guys are going to read. So when I'm reading, it's a good chance for you to listen to how I am pronouncing the words and to see if you understand what's what's being read. And then you guys will have a chance to pronounce these words. And then I hope we can get through it, and then we'll talk about it. Do you guys think this is a, a good idea or not a good idea? Okay. So, Portland, Oregon, seven minutes into his new musical, Somewhere in Time, the Broadway producer Ken Davenport leapt off his stool at the back of the theater the other night and began pointing, not at the stage, but at a nearby laptop that showed, in a fever chart line, the reactions of 60 audience members as they turned handheld dials among three choices love this part neutral about this part and hate this part okay Amparo, why don't you start us off you're over here on my left okay. <laughs> seven Thanks. minutes into his new musical somewhere in time the robot broadway producer ken davenport leapt off his stool at the back of the theater the other night and began pointed not at the stage, but at, at a nearby laptop that showed in, in a fever chart line the reactions of 60 audience members as they turned handheld dials among three choices. Love this part, neutral about this part, or and hate this part. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let me just explain a few things here. I'll explain some words. If you guys have any questions while I'm explaining, uh, just let me know okay so basically this guy here he's the producer he's the one paying me to make the show happen uh, there at and he leapt off his stool so that means he jumped off out of his chair that he was sitting on and he was pointing at this computer and it was showing what they call a fever chart line that's a type of graph that's showing the responses of these 60 audience members because what they were doing is as they were watching the show they were they were holding these little um, devices here this little machine and they were making their choices they were saying I love this part I'm neutral which means eh, I don't I don't really love it or hate it it's just okay you're just neutral about it or they hated it so this is a type of uh, marketing research so he wanted to find out what do people think of the show when they're sitting there Okay, so here's how they did it. The dials seemed to pinpoint a problem with the song Tick, Tick, Tick. The fever line slid as the main character, Richard, 
lamenting the rush of life, was interrupted by dry dialogue from his brother. The dials matched my instincts, Mr. Davenport explained during intermission at Portland Center Stage here, where he was trying this system for the first time for the musical's world premiere. By the time we get the show to New York, I bet we'll drop that dialogue. Okay. All right, Donato, why don't you read that next two, the next two paragraphs there? And yeah. hi, Salwa. Um, okay, that one that you have just read? Okay. Yes, so, exactly. The, the dials seem to, be, to pinpoint a problem with the song Tick, Tick, Tick. The fever line slid at the, as the main character, Richard, lamenting the rush of life, was interrupted by the dry dialogue from his brother. The dial smashed my instincts. Mr. Dainport explained during intermission at Portland Center Stage here, where he was trying this system for the first time for the musical's world premiere. Mm -hmm. By the time we get the show to New York, I bet we'll drop the dialogue. Yeah, good. I want to show you guys what a, a fever line graph is. So it just looks like this. So as the people were turning their dials, the, the computer was reading it, and it was seeing um, a chart like this, a little graph. Little, and so he was seeing as it goes up or down, depending on how the people were voting for it. Okay, so that's what that is. So basically, it seemed to pinpoint. When you pin something, it, it, you point it out but it's very detailed. So they were able to pinpoint or to detect or to notice that there some people didn't like what was happening during this particular song. So I guess the main character was lamenting. Lament something that means you're complaining about it, you're feeling sad about it. So he was probably complaining about the rush of life, how busy life can be. But as he was singing the song, he got interrupted by his the brother character with a dry dialogue. So dry means kind of boring, kind of uh, serious, not very funny or fun. And so uh, this guy says that he had an instinct. So your instincts is like what your gut tells you, what you think about it inside. And his, these dials, what people voted for, it matched. So it was the same. So they didn't like it, and his instinct was that he didn't like it either. So he explains during intermission. Intermission is when you take a break from a theater show. You have the first part, then you have an intermission for a break and to go to the bathroom or get a drink or something, and then you have the second part of the play. Uh, so yeah, so he says, I bet we'll drop that dialogue. That means I think. If you say I bet, it means you think or you, um, you know. Uh, that that's going to happen. So they'll probably get rid of this part because he didn't like it and it turns out that the audience, based on the dials and stuff that they were voting for, they didn't like it either. So he thought that was a, a good, good indication. Thus, dial testing, common in politics, television, and movies, has now arrived in the theater. Though at this point, Mr. Davenport is the first to embrace it eagerly for Broadway, the very idea of it is raising questions in the industry about what makes good theater. Did Michelangelo ask dial testers, do you like this part of David's leg, said Emmanuel Asenberg, a Tony Award winner and a producer for 45 years? Did Beethoven ask, was the second movement too dull? This is scary. Do we want to test market Broadway until it becomes a theme park? Okay. Who's next? Hamid? Yes. Plus, uh, dial testing common in politics, television and movies has now arrived in the theater. Though at this point, Mr. Davenport is the first to embrace it eagerly for Broadway. The very last year, of, uh, it is raising questions in the, in the industry about what makes a good theater. Did Michelangelo and uh, Jello ask uh, dial testers, do you like this part of David's, uh, David's leg? Said uh, Emmanuel Eisenberg, 
a Tony Award winner and a producer for 45 years. The Beethoven asked what was the second movement to dance. This is a scary. Do we want to test a uh, market? Mm -hmm. Do we want to? Cannot... OK. Uh, Broadway until it becomes a theme park. A theme park, yeah. So I guess, according to this article, this dial testing, that's what it, dial testing is already being used in, in many other industries, in politics, television, movies, and now it's the theater. And so he is the first one to embrace it. When you embrace something, it means you like it. You want to use it. You want to do it. And um, also embrace means to hug somebody, but in this case, it means to, you, to try something and to want to use it, um, to do it. And so, but it's raising questions. That means people are, are thinking, do we really want to use this? Is it going to make good theater? Is this going to help us make better plays and better musicals? So this guy, uh, he's a Tony Award winner, so that's... You know, they say that because that means that gives him credibility. He's not just some beginner. He's been doing this for 45 years. And he's basically saying, you know, did these great uh, in artists uh, do this? Did, they didn't ask everybody what they liked. So Michelangelo or Beethoven, they didn't ask people to tell them, oh, did you like this part or did you like this? And so he's saying that this is scary. It means he's afraid of what will happen. Um, he is. He thinks doing this type of testing is not wise. And he says, he asks the question, do we want to test market Broadway? Broadway is, you probably know, in New York City, Broadway is where all the famous musicals are played. Um, and he says, do we want to do this in, until it becomes a theme park? Disneyland. Disneyland is a theme park, Magic Mountain, places like that. So do we really want our uh, creative people, our artists, who come up with these wonderful things to be asking everybody what they think about uh, this? So let's see what they say. Focus groups and audience surveys are increasingly part of theater already, to the distress of some producers like Mr. Eisenberg who see them as crutches that lead to lowest common denominator shows. While the dials seem like a natural extension of focus groups, if not a more precise gauge of real-time audience reaction, several producers dismissed them as the most simplistic and desperate research tool yet, the enemy of groundbreaking work. Okay, Laszlo? Okay, uh, focus groups and audience surveys are increasingly part of the theatre already to the distress of some producers like Mr. Eisenberg who see them as crutches that lead to lowest common domination, dominator mm -hmm. shows. Why the deal, deal seem like the natural extraction, extraction of focus groups, if not a more precise gauge of real-time real, real audience reaction, several producers dismissed them as the most simple and disparate research tool yet, the enemy of grand breaking work. Mm -hmm. So focus groups, these are groups that people use, they call together, they usually pay you, and you usually um, give them your opinion. So for example, they use it a lot, like if you're trying to develop a new product, like a new drink, let's say, they give you lots of different uh, tastes of the new drink, and then they ask you, which one did you like best? That's what a focus group is, and they use it for marketing uh, research purposes. And also audience surveys, so that after you see the show or a TV program or a movie, they give you a survey and you um, answer the questions so they learn what parts you liked, what you didn't like, that type of thing. And so there, some people are saying this is already happening. It's becoming increasingly part. 
So it's already happening more and more. Increasingly means more and more. But it's to the distress. Distress is when something anxious or frustrated or uh, worried. So people like this producer, uh, Mr. Eisenberg, a producer is the one who puts the show together. It's not the director, but it's the one who like gets the money for it and makes sure that it can be made. Um, he sees them as crutches. Crutches are what you use when you break your leg and you have to walk around. And it's also how you describe something that uh, is... Uh, it's like if your program isn't very good, you're using this as a crutch to help you figure out um, what's going to be good. But the problem is, he thinks it's going to lead to lowest common denominator shows. That means if you ask different people what they think, you might not get what he's calling a groundbreaking thing so amazing and fabulous, something that nobody knew ahead of time that they would like but it turned out to be great something that groundbreaking is something new and innovative because if you're always asking for everybody um, what they think it's very simplistic maybe it's not uh, so wonderful so they say it's a desperate research tool. so that means that they're not very happy about it it's something if you're desperate for something it means you're you're grasping for straws you you don't you're not very good at what you're doing you're just trying to please people. So that's not always what artists want to do. Others, like Sue Frost, who used focus groups on her show Memphis, which won the best musical Tony in 2010, were intrigued but skeptical that dials would catch on among Broadway producers because the technology might make audiences, quote, so hypercritical that you get more data and opinions than are useful. I also believe that I can tell a lot by standing in the back every night and listening to the audience, she added. You know when they're bored, when a song is going too long. Okay, Salwa, read that part. Okay. okay. Uh, this old school approach. No, here. Reading. Read this part that I just read. Others like Sue Frost. Okay. See that? Okay, uh, others like Sue Frost, who used the focus groups on her show Memphis, which won uh, the best mu musical Tony in 2010, were integrated by Skeptical that deals would catch on among Broadway uh, producer because the technology m might make audience so hypercritical. Hypo hyper hyper yeah, hypercritical. Mm -hmm. Then you get more data and opinion that are useful. Mm -hmm. you keep going. I also believe that I can tell a lot by standing uh, in the back every night and listening to audience. She added, uh, you know when they are bored when uh, uh, a song is going too long. Yeah. So, this person, Sue Frost, she used focus groups. She did not use the dial uh, voting. She did use focus groups to figure out what, what people liked about the show that she made. And it did win an award. Um, so, she's intrigued. When it means you are interested. You're like, hmm, I think that might be interesting to find more about. But also skeptical. So if you're skeptical, you, you don't think it's going to be a good idea. It's not really going to be uh, working uh, to the best. So she's skeptical. Um, skeptical that it would catch on. Catch on means that if something catches on, like... Uh, Area, then lots of people use it. So if it catches on, then lots of people will start using it. But she's skeptical. She doesn't think that it will catch on with Broadway producers because it might make them too hypercritical. Hypercritical means very critical, um, overly critical, and you, you're going to get more data and opinions than are useful or helpful. You do, it's sometimes you can get overwhelmed by too many opinions, too much information. And this person says she can she can uh, tell a lot. That means she can understand a lot about what people think um, just by standing in the back 
and listening to what they're saying. You know, she she is going to know whether or not the audience thinks the songs are too boring or they're too long or something like that. This old school approach, relying on eyes and ears, not gizmos, evokes the era of auteur producers like David Merrick and Harold Prince who began new musicals out of town and compiled fix-it lists based on their aesthetic sensibilities, the body language of audiences, and feedback from trusted friends and critics. During the out-of-town run of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, before its Broadway opening in 1962, Mr. Prince drew on input from his friend Jerome Robbins and the talents of the composer Stephen Sondheim to come up with a new opening number, Comedy Tonight, which is now beloved in musical theater. Okay, Amparo? This old school approach, relying on eyes and ears, not gizmos, evokes the era of a terror producer like David Merritt and Howard Prince, who began new musicals out of town and compiled a fitted list based on the, their aesthetic sensibilities, the body language of audience, and feedback from trusted friends and critics. During the out-of-town run uh, of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum before its Broadway opening in 1962. Mr. Prince drew an input from his friend Jerome Robbins and the talents of the composer Stephen Sondheim to come up with a new opening number, Comedy Tonight, which is now beloved in, in musical theater. Mm -hmm. So old school approach. Uh, anytime you're talking about the way it used to be done in the past, you could say it's old school. So you could be talking about old school music or oh, just anything that you did it. That's how they did it in the past. So the old school approach or the old school way of doing things was to rely on, so to, to just to take into consideration or to believe uh, the eyes and the ears. So to, to, to look at how people were seeing things, to listen to what they were saying, and to not rely on gizmos. Gizmos are devices, toys, tricks, things like that. So this evokes, this make, to evoke means make sure about, so this makes you think about the time period of these people, these guys, David and Harold, when they began um, their musicals out of town. So what this means is maybe uh, no um, Broadway musicals, they don't usually start out on Broadway. They usually start in other cities to see whether or not people like them and if they're going to make money. And so they would start their musicals out of town, like in Portland, Oregon, or maybe San Francisco, or somewhere like a city like that. And um, they would compile, which means to get they would make a fix-it list. So this would be a list of things needed to fix, um, and that would be based on their aesthetic sensibilities, so uh, how they look, their aesthetics is how things look, and the body language of the audience, so what were people doing when they were watching the show, and then also the feedback, what did their friends and the critics tell them about the show. And then they would learn, and then they would, they would make the changes before it goes to Broadway. So that's what it says here. Before they opened on Broadway, they already had input. So they drew on input. That means they, they used input. They used what people said, their friends. And this uh, Stephen Sondheim, who's a very uh, famous musician or music composer for musicals. And they were able to create a better show based on all of that information that's uh, and it did well on Broadway so they fixed it before it went to Broadway yet few producers today are in the mold of Merrick Mr. Prince and other hit makers who have been lionized for having a sixth sense about producing Mr. Davenport himself acknowledges that his last two outings on Broadway as lead producer the current Macbeth with Alan Cumming and the 2011 revival of Godspell were modest sellers and did not receive any Tony nominations. 
The harsh reality of commercial Broadway today is that 75% of shows lose money and that many producers struggle to develop productions that will have mass appeal. Okay, Donato. Okay. Yet few producers today are in the mode of Marek, Mr. Prince, and other hit makers who have been lionized for having a sixth sense about producing. Mr. Demport himself acknowledges uh, that his last two outing of Broadway's Broadway as lead producer, the current Macbeth with Alan Cumming, and uh, the 2011 uh, revival of Godspell were modest sellers and did not receive uh, any Tony nominations. The harsh reality, reality of uh, commercial Broadway today is that 75% uh, of shows lose money and that many producers struggle to develop production that will have mass appeal. Mm -hmm. Good. So few producers today are in the mold of. We <coughs> should use that phrase, the mold of. It means very few people are like these people. So um, when you're when you uh, the mold is how people uh, how you make things. So like if you cast a mold for like a, a bowl or something, then uh, that's how you make it. So that's a phrase talking about they're not the same. That means that they're not really like these people. Um, the hit makers, those are the people who make successful shows, make hits, and they have been lionized for having a sixth sense. When you lionize somebody, you make them uh, more famous or popular, and you think they're so great, like lions. Uh, they have a sixth sense. Of course, we have five senses, and whenever you talk about something else that people know how to do, they sometimes call it the sixth sense. So their sixth sense is about uh, producing great shows. But in actuality, um, some of their most recent shows have not been that well received. So these one two that they talk about, Macbeth and Godspell, they say were modest sellers. That means they, they sold, but they didn't really make very much money. They weren't big hits, and they didn't get any nominations, so they were not in the running for any awards, the Tony Awards. The harsh reality, harsh means someone or um, just hard to hard to take, hard to understand. So it's harsh, but it um, it feels sad to these people, of course. It's a harsh, but it's reality. It's reality. It's not a happy reality. It's not a exciting reality, because the fact is that seventy five percent of shows lose money. So when you're making a lot of money and most of the shows are not making any money and they're struggling. Um, to have mass appeal. If you have mass people, the masses, like what you're doing and will pay, and then of course if they're paying, then it'll be a hit. You'll, they'll like it, lots of people will go, they'll tell their friends. And that's of course what people want, the producers especially, because the producers are the ones paying the money to make the shows, and how much the show makes um, is what they're looking for. So why not use dials and every other tool possible to create more musicals that please audiences and turn a profit, said Damien Bazadona, president of Situation Interactive, a marketing company that works on Broadway shows. Dial testing caught on with television commercials and series in the 1960s and 70s and gained wider popularity in the 1980s as political strategists tested audience responses to speeches by President Ronald Reagan and other leaders. Frank Lutz, okay, uh, hold on, a consultant who has pioneered dial testing in political messaging said the feedback did not guarantee a successful result, but oftentimes can prevent failure. Okay. Laszlo. Yes. Go ahead. Why? Yes. Why not? Why, why not use dice and every other tools possible to create more musicals that play, please audiences and turn a profit? Said Diamond Bazadon, 
president of Situation Interactive a Marketing Company that works on Broadway shows. Die testing count on with television commercials and series in 1960s and uh, 70s and gained wider population popularity in the 1980s as political strategies tested audience response the speech speeches by President Ronald Reagan and other leaders. Frank Loons, a Republican consulant who was fired by testing in political messaging said the feedback did not guarantee a successful measure, but oft times can prevent failure. Failure. Mm -hmm. Failure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So yeah, so this guy's opinion is why not? Why not use anything that will help you um, turn a profit? That means to make a profit. And a profit is the money that you make be after you paid for all of the costs of creating the show. So that's the money that they make. And he works for a marketing company, so his job is to help uh, people find ways to market things that will sell. And they're saying a little bit of history is that the dial testing caught on. So here we have that uh, phrase again, John. So people, that means people started using it in the television and series uh, in the 60s and 70s and later in the 80s with political strategists that's a, a soft G sound strategists so those are the people who write the speeches and they're trying to uh, make the politicians more popular amongst the people so they want to make sure that the things that they're writing uh, people like and what he's saying is you can't necessarily guarantee, you can't make sure, so guarantee something is to make sure that it's successful, that you want a successful result, but oftentimes, meaning many times, you can prevent. So even if you don't know exactly what you what the best is going to be for everybody, you, sh you are going to learn what people don't really like, and that will make sure that you don't have a failure. A failure is when you blow it, You de it's not popular, nobody likes it, that's a failure. The sharpest reactions are to the things that aren't working. The lulls that undermine the impact of a scene, or the characters that don't make an impact, or the words and phrases that don't grab people, said Mr. Luntz, who has also done dial testing for many television shows, which he declined to name. I'm a little surprised Broadway is doing this, to be honest, he added. Producers have a vision in their head, and they don't want the masses affecting or impacting that vision. Okay, Salwa? Yeah. The impact of, scene, of a scene or the character characters? Uh, wait, no, wait, hold on. Read the sharpest oh. reactions. Yeah. What I just read. Oh, okay. The sharpest reactions are to the things that aren't working, the aisles that undermine mm -hmm. uh, the impact of of a, of, a, of a scene, or the characters that don't make an impact, or the words and the phrases that don't grab people, mm -hmm. uh, said Mr. Lons who has also done uh, deal testing for many television shows which he declined to name mm -hmm. I am a little surprised Broadway Broadway is doing this to be honest he added producers have have a vision in their head and they don't want the message affecting or impacting that vision yes okay all right, the sharpest reaction. That means the biggest reactions or strongest reactions. Um, when you get, you know, the people turning the dials, they're really focusing in on the things that aren't working, that are not working, things that they don't like. So that might be a lull in the scene. A lull is kind of like maybe you're watching something and you're kind of excited and you're interested and then it gets a little bit boring. And so you're like, eh. You don't really like that part. That's a lull. 
So, and that undermines the impact of a scene. So, as a writer and a producer, if you want a certain scene to have a, a good impact, you want people to really uh, feel what's going on, but it's not really written very well, then that's going to undermine that. It's going to make it not work the way you wanted it to work. So that's getting, giving them feedback. Um, or if the characters don't make an impact, an impact is when you make a, make a difference, when something makes a difference, you want the audience goes, whoa, or they laugh, or they cry, or something. That's an impact. But if the characters are not doing that, then the, then the show is probably kind of too boring. And so, and it's not grabbing people. If it's grabbing people, to grab something, you think of like you use your hands to grab, you know, you grab your piece of bread off your plate or something. But in this case, the words and the phrases are, they want them to grab the audience. So when the characters are speaking, it's either funny or it's emotional or it's, or it's dramatic or something. But maybe it's not working. So this is, uh, that's how they're figuring out if, if what they wrote, the words, the dialogue, that kind of stuff, is actually getting the effect that they want. And this uh, dial testing is being used also on many shows, but he declined to name. That means he did not agree to tell them um, the names of the television shows that he's using this for. So he declined. He said no. So to decline something means to say no. Um, he says he's a little surprised because producers have a vision. When you have a vision, it's like, oh, I see it this way, and this is how it's going to be, and it's going to be amazing. And a lot of times, if you have a vision, you're a visionary person, you don't really care what the masses are saying because you're the one is, that's going to make a difference. You're the one who's going to present something um, special or new or innovative. Like Steve Jobs, for example, of Apple, he had a lot of visions about um, the products, and he wasn't interested in asking every single person what they thought about it. He, he had his own vision. Uh, and he doesn't want people affecting or impacting. So that means changing it or affecting how he thinks about it. So usually uh, he was surprised because producers usually like to think about it and then present it, not try to please everybody all the time. So Mr. Davenport said the dials were guidance, not a veto for his judgment about somewhere in time based on a 1980 film about a playwright who travels back through the years to pursue a romance with an actress. The movie, which starred Christopher Reeve, was critically panned but earned fans, particularly among women, leading Mr. Davenport to view Somewhere in Time as a pre-tested brand that might appeal on Broadway since roughly two-thirds of audiences there are female. Okay. Amparo. Mr. Davenport said the dials were guidance, not a, not a video, for his judgment about somewhere in time, based on a 1980 film about a playwright who travels back through the years to pursue a romance with an actress. The movie, which starred uh, Christopher Reeve, was critically panned but earned fans, particularly among women, leading Mr. Davenport to view somewhere in time as a pretested brand that might appeal on Broadway, since roughly those there's of audience there are female. Mm -hmm. Good. So he said the dials are guidance, that means they help guide, not to necessarily veto. When you veto, you say no. So he's not going to look at the results as necessarily um, uh, having the power to veto certain songs or scenes or something like that, but rather just as a guidance for them to know um, how they might be able to change some things to make people like it better. So I, apparently this is a, a based on a film. So when something is based that's what they used, the story is already coming from somewhere else. It's not exactly the same, but it has elements. It's based on that. Um, and so he he said that it was critically panned. So that means crit the critics did not like it. When they pan something, they, they um, dismiss it or they say uh, it wasn't very good. So the movie was critically panned. That means the critics did not like it, but it earned fans, which means the fans liked it. So 
the movie critics didn't like it, but the people paying the money to go see it, they did like it, especially women. And so he believes that it is already a pre-tested brand. So because it was already played and, and got people to like it and people paid money to see it, it was pre-tested. It's already been tested. So the, the pre there means already, beforehand. And it's a brand, so it's a it's a movie, it's a it's a product really, a movie, and it might have appeal, so it might be interesting to Broadway audiences, especially because roughly, so the GH there has an F sound, roughly, and that means um, about, so about two thirds are female, so half of the audiences at Broadway musicals are female, so that's why he thinks it might work. He even wrote the musical's book after other writers passed and held closed doors, closed door readings before reaching out to Chris Coleman, artistic director of Portland Center Stage, about mounting the tryout. The Portland Theater had never worked before with a New York producer on a musical aiming for Broadway, and Mr. Coleman, liking the material, said yes quickly. The show, which runs through Sunday, received mixed to good reviews. Okay, Donato. Okay, he even, he even wrote the musical's book after other writers passed and held closed door readings before reaching, reaching out the Chris Coleman, artist, artistic director of Portland Center Stage, about mounting the tryout. The Portland Theater had never worked before with a new work producer on a musical aiming for Broadway. And Mr. Coleman, like the material, said, the, said yes quickly. The show, which runs through Sunday, received max to good reviews. Yeah, mixed to good. Okay, so he, uh, he, uh, he wrote the musical's book, so... Even if the writers had passed. That means when you pass, you say, no, I don't want to do that. I'll pass. So they, other writers passed up the opportunity, but he wrote it, and he um, did some closed-door readings. That means everybody wasn't invited. It was just specific actors and actresses were invited to read through the script. And um, since they liked it, they would mount the tryout. That means to... when you means you put it on, you produce it, you, you do it. So the Portland Center stage uh, agreed that they would um, have this show be played at their uh, theater as a tryout. So when you're trying something out, you're testing it. So they're testing it in Portland, Oregon first before they try to get it to go to Broadway in New York. So they're testing it out with these new dial testers and seeing and so, um, yes, liking the material. So he, because he liked the material, the material is the book, the script for the musical, he said yes quickly. And it got mixed to good reviews. So mixed reviews are like, yeah, some people like it, some people didn't, and then to a lot of people liking it. So if you say mixed to good, it means, you know, pretty good. So it's, it's had a good start. Over three performances of dial testing, no single song bombed, but parts of songs and scenes caused consistent dips in the fever line. Mr. Davenport said those moments would be assessed by the creative team and perhaps be changed. One musical number that received the show's highest dial score, 80 out of a possible 100, was A Trip to the Grand which delivered ballroom choreography and lavish period costumes, the sort of big production number that musical traditionalists love. Okay, Lazo. Over there, performance of dialing testing, no single song bomb, but part of songs and scenes caused consistent dips in the fever line. Mr. Davenport said those monuments would be assist, assisted by the creative team and perhaps be changed. Mm -hmm. One musical number that re received the show's highest die score, uh, 
15 out of the possible 100 was a trip to the ground, which delivered ballroom choreography ke uh, and lavish rapari old customs. The short of big produ production number that musical tradi traditionalists love. Yeah. So, over three performances of dial testing, no single song bombed. So that means none of the songs were rated as horrible or terrible. To bomb means to fail, to be, um, to have people say, oh, that's disgusting, I don't like that song, it's horrible. So none of them bombed, none of them were voted down or were failed. Um, but parts of songs and scenes caused consistent dips. So remember they're looking at the graph with that line and the, the graph means that when it goes down people were voting that they didn't really like that part very much. When it goes up that means they liked it more. So these moments, the, the moments where there were the would be assessed. When you assess something that means you look at it, you um, uh, you uh, what it's the word? <laughs> You're going to evaluate it. You're going to say whether or not, okay, we should change this or not. So maybe they will um, be changing some of the things based on those uh, dips, based on the, the votes that the people gave it. That the, it wasn't very good. And but this this song got a good high score, 80 out of a possible 100. And it's interesting because it was the highest score, and it was. Um, uh, a ballroom choreography. So it delivered, that means it, it gave, they showed you ballroom choreography. Choreography, the, the dance, how the dance is being uh, made. So how the dancers were dancing and it was a very lavish period costumes. So that means it was um, very fancy, very uh, probably very expensive, very um, uh, colorful costumes from a, 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 the time period that they were doing. Lavish means very wealthy, rich, fancy, that kind of thing. And this is the kind of thing that traditionalists, that means who like to go to musicals a lot, they like these types of scenes. These types of scenes where people are singing and dancing and the costumes are really amazing. So it wasn't a surprise to them that 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 would be popular. This Portland production cost one million dollars and our Broadway production will cost ten million dollars. But that score of 80 tells me that maybe ours should cost eleven million dollars, Mr. Davenport said. Maybe another one million dollars could get us to ninety in that number. As for the dial holders who sat scattered throughout the audience, the chance to play armchair producer was a treat, even for those who were cool to the show. The time travel scenes were hard to buy, and I felt grateful I had the chance to say so, said Holly Ning, 33, as she held up her gray four-inch long dial. There have been more negative moments than positive, but I didn't want to be too mean to the show, and the dials made it more fun. Okay, Salwa, the last part. Okay. Uh, uh, this Portland production cost one million dollars. And our Broadway production will cost uh, 10, uh, 10 million dollars. But that score, uh, score of E.T. tell me that maybe our should cost 11 million dollars. Mr. Denver said maybe other million uh, dollars uh, could get us to uh, 90 in that number. After, uh, as for the deal holders who said scatter, Mm -hmm. It was uh, the audience the chance to to play our, uh, our armchair armchair, mm -hmm. armchair pro producer was a treat even for those who were cool to the show. The time travel scenes were hard to buy, and I felt grateful I had the chance to say uh, so. Um, said Holly Ng. 33 as the, she is held up her gray four inch long di dial. Dial? Her, uh, dial. There have been more negative moments than positive. But I didn't want to be too mean to the show and the dials made it more fun. 
<laughs> yeah. So they think that maybe if they spend some more money to make more of those scenes, then they'll get a higher number, which means people will like it more. And just a couple of things here to explain. Scattered through the audience. That means they, were, they weren't all in a row, but they were scattered. So one or two were down here. Some others were up over here in this area and other areas. So when you scatter something, it's in lots of different areas. They got to play armchair producer. Armchair is when you, you're uh, sitting in your chair and you're doing things. And they were cool to the show. So a lot of people were cool to the show, which means they didn't necessarily say it was great. They were kind of lukewarm about it. They were not hot about it. If you're hot about something, you really like it. If you're cool, you're kind of like, eh, it's okay, but not that great. The travel scenes were hard to buy. That means they were hard to believe. They didn't really buy them. If you don't buy into something, it means you don't really believe it. But it sounds like she had fun. She said there were more negative moments than positive. That means she didn't really like uh, she thought there were more things that she didn't like than what she did like, but she didn't want to be too mean to the show. <laughs> to be mean is to give them all negative uh, votes. But she said it was fun having the dials there. So that's kind of interesting. I don't know, Ampuro, what do you think about uh, people being able to sit there and vote while they're watching? Is that going to be helpful to the making a better show, do you think? I don't think so. No? <laughs> no, because maybe the audience is not an expertise in, in, in analyzing of the details, so yeah. you are going to get a result that don't reflect the reality. Yeah. People that don't really know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, for, for example, that depends on the humor or the mood that you are watching, maybe. Um, yeah, totally. I, I am yeah. Not, yeah. yeah. So, that's, that's a good point. It's not a, a real result. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good point. What What do you think, Donato? Do you think it's a good marketing tool and they'll get a better better product? I think it's just a, um, an information more that uh -huh. uh, you can take the take uh, in, into account or not. Into account or into consideration, uh -huh. Consideration or not. So, I think that um, I, I didn't understand how much does it cost uh, in the end, like the per the the percentual of the the cost of this. Uh, the show. No, this mar this marketing uh, uh, oh. test. Yeah, I yeah, because it didn't it didn't tell us how much it actually cost to do the testing, but uh, they it just told us how much money they're going to spend on the show. So they think that they're going to spend $10 million to create the Broadway version of the show. So I don't, we don't know how much it costs. Probably not that much. I don't know. With the hand, little handheld dial things, I don't yeah, know how much the, it is. But yeah. I, it means uh, also that, uh, for example, a new, a new musical, a new, a new show should be like presented uh, at a restrict a mess of people uh, yes. who will be used uh, like to to judge uh, this musical. Uh, this right. is the meaning of uh, what we have uh, just read. Yes. Well, that's that's what they use focus groups for. But this one, where they they just gave them to random people, so they weren't uh, people who knew necessarily they were going to do that. They just asked them, and they're trying it out. So they're not necessarily experts in theater or yeah. anything. They're just uh, f fans, customers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just surprised that uh, they were going to, uh, uh, like, in this way. Yeah. They they gave the give the opportunity to like to viewing the surprise of a new product, a new film, a new musical. Yeah. Oh, I see. They, yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but that's actually what they're doing because um, they're trying it out. So that's a common thing. Before you spend $10 million creating a Broadway musical, they try it out in a small theater in a smaller city to see if people are going to like it. So that's what they're really, doing. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a good idea. Yeah. Laszlo, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Lisa. This class is very interesting to me. But but uh, it's very difficult. Is is the two? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe. Well, you did very well when you when you were reading, and so maybe 
you learned some new words and vocabulary. It was very yeah. difficult. It's a New York Times article, and it's it's about a topic that's not necessarily well known to everybody. Yes, not, uh, not everybody knows yes, <laughs> musicals. Many new words. Uh, yes. Me and yeah. and uh, try uh, understand uh, this text yeah uh, uh, you, well you did a good job reading it and yeah if you you can always uh, keep looking at it and maybe look up some words you know in your own language if you want to try to understand it but it did have some good language and some um, good words that describe uh, this this type of thing lots of uh, phrasal verbs there too like to catch on and to buy into and that type of thing yeah. so yeah. This is this is good for for, for you uh, upload these uh, uh, important uh, words. Yeah, those are sometimes hard to understand in English. We yes. use a lot of them. <laughs> verbs, yes. phrasal verbs. Okay, Salwa, what do you what do you think? Would you like to uh, watch a a theater show and be able to vote to with a dial? Would that be fun? Uh, yeah, it will be so fun for me to watch a uh, theater and give uh, a feedback or yeah. my opinion about the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, but I think they're to to increase money for the show. Uh, yeah. It will be benefit uh, in in on one side. It will increase mm -hmm. the number of, of uh, audience, but it mm -hmm. will not increase the, or uh, make people satisfy about uh, their show. Uh huh. So yes, it may increase the audience, but it it might not necessarily make a better show, artistically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that seems to. What I liked about this article was that it actually shows kind of the dilemma that we are in in our modern day business money culture. Because um, you know, as a business, you want people to buy things and you want them to enjoy your products. But at the same time, if you are only looking to them to tell you what's good, you might not come up with new products or new innovations because maybe they haven't thought about what they, you know, could use. So it's an interesting thing, especially with art and art artists and creative type people trying to create new things that people may at first might not even like, and it might take a little while. But if, if they're already saying, no, we don't like it, and therefore the artists don't produce anything like that, then there might not be really new innovative ideas that people might take time to get used to. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. It's yeah. interesting. Yeah, so it's, I thought it was interesting because it's business versus creativity and artists and things like that, making money versus just putting out a vision of something different. Yeah. 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 At the end, the best way it's in the middle, no? Yeah, exactly. Because you got still gotta. Right now, we still have to use money, so artists do need money too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thanks for coming to class and reading, and I hope you uh, learned some new phrases and some new vocabulary, and you enjoyed uh, practicing your English. You guys did a good job. Yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks you, so Lisa. Much. For okay. Thank you, Lisa. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye. You can use PayPal if you have a PayPal account. Um, otherwise, you can just use a credit card. So uh, the Verbaling classes do cost money, but it's a pretty good deal. You get to have an hour-long class uh, for $3, or you get to have uh, as many hour-long classes as you would like if you join with the premium membership. There's classes going on um, most of the time. Usually, we try to have a class every hour. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the classes are all different. We have different teachers, and we have different topics for the classes. So uh, for example, this is a reading class. So in the reading class, you actually get to do a lot of things. You get to listen to me read, so you hear pronunciation, see if you can understand. Then you get to practice uh, your reading and then you also get to practice your speaking because oftentimes we discuss the article and you get to say what you think about the article and what your ideas are so if you want to join then you can join now I do see that there are quite a few people who have opened the document so 
that's great. But um, nobody has joined me in the Google Hangouts yet, so I'm I'm wondering if everybody can can see me here in the Google Hangouts. I'm going to just make sure and check on the Verbling page to make sure everything is working okay. So um, yes, if you guys want anybody wants to join, then you need to join it now so we we can get the class started. Okay. Otherwise, so we'll just wait here to see if anybody uh, shows up, and uh, we can get started. This is going to be um, an intermediate class, so it's not a, a beginner class. It's not a simple reading, but uh, it is. Uh, it's a good run. It's a New York Times article. So if you are are wanting to improve your English, especially if you are studying for something like the TOEFL test or the IELTS exam, then this is the type of uh, reading that you want to make sure that you know how to do, that you can read it, and that you can answer uh, questions about it, and that you understand the words. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I see some people in the Verbling chat. They have their reasons. I totally understand. Mine, uh, if you're at work, it makes it difficult. Um, everybody has different schedules, so that's why Verbling tries to have a class every hour so that, you know, if you're in a different time zone or you have to work and then you're only available later, then that's fine. So some hours and sometimes work better for some people than other people. Hi, Hamid. How are you? I'm okay. What about you? Good. Hamid, how did your test go? Uh, my reading uh, essay uh, is uh, a little bit hard for me. Oh, okay. Uh, listening and speaking is so so, uh, mm -hmm. but writing is good. Okay, okay. When when will you have the results? Uh, maybe beginning of July. Okay, so in about a week or something, maybe two weeks. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, I want to ask, uh, I wrote uh, 210 words uh, for uh, integrated uh, parts, and I wrote uh, 325 words for uh -huh. independent essay. Yeah. Uh, are they good? Um, I don't know the number of S. Does it? Did you see on a web page? I'm not sure, like, uh, how many they want. Sorry? I think that, uh, so tell me again for the essay, how many words? Uh, for integrated essay, I wrote 210 words, uh, total ones uh, between 150 and 225 words. Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, independent essay, uh, total ones, uh, three, uh, minimum 300 uh, words. Yeah. And I wrote uh, 325 words. Okay. Yeah, so that should be great. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how did you feel about it? Did you feel like it... Uh... Uh, a little bit nervous uh, and uh, curious. Was it... Did it, uh, did it seem difficult? Uh, some parts are uh, difficult because, uh, you know, I tried to first time. Yes. So uh, the real and uh, other environments are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, did you? Was it difficult because of uh, not understanding the vocabulary that they were using, or what part was difficult for you? Uh, I could be better. I mean this uh, because uh, some parts uh, are difficult because. Um, how can I explain? I could be better uh, because my expectation is uh, uh, was uh, I think myself uh, can I do this exam? Yeah. Uh, but after that, uh, I I am a little bit I uh, a little bit regret for myself. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I could be better. Yeah. So, but do you know what, how you can improve? Like, do you need to learn more words to understand, or uh, what do you think you can get better in? Uh, I understood. Yeah. Uh, 
for example, in speaking part, uh, I cannot, I could not uh, the make structure. Uh, mm -hmm. I I could uh, take notes, but I cannot uh, speak clearly or uh, structural. Mm. Okay. My pro my problem is that. Okay. Did you find that it was uh, very quick when you had to speak? Did it did it go very quickly? Yes, because uh, time is uh, limited. Yes, time is limited. That's right. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just keep working on it then. Let me say hi to uh, Laszlo. Hi, Laszlo. How are you? Hi, Lisa. I'm fine, thank you. And you? Good. You're a beginner. You don't sound like a beginner. <laughs> yes, yes. My very big problem in in the speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to be reading, which will help uh, you guys in the speaking as well. And so far, you guys are the only two in the class right now. So we let's get started because it's a little bit of a long article actually, but I think there's some good uh, vocabulary in there and some ideas that we can uh, talk about. So you guys can open up the the link. Did you guys get the link already, Amit? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So this is what it's called. It's called dialing up a hit. That's question mark. Dialing up a hit. Influence over musical is in the crowd's hands. All right. So dialing up. Dialing up is when you uh, usually on the uh, old phones you have you used, used to have to spin your finger on the numbers that was called dialing now dialing uh, means you know on the phones we don't dial we touch it usually if you have an iPhone for example you call somebody you just punch in the numbers but this little device that you see here that these ladies have is a little machine that they are using and that is called a dial right there that little that button and you turn it and you you turn it to tell if you like something or you don't like something and it's it's a way that they're trying to figure out what crowds like so this is part of uh, research and marketing research and some people think it's a good idea and other people think it's not uh, a good idea for artists to, to do this uh, hi. hi there Amparo we have some people joining us hi Amparo and hi Donato Welcome, you guys are just in time. We're going to get started here reading. And we're going to be uh, reading this article together. So I'm going to Good start. Evening, uh... Yes, hi. Hi. How are you? I'm so fine. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, so uh, this is from Portland, Oregon. All right, so I'm going to read first, and then you guys are going to read. So when I'm reading, it's a good chance for you to listen to how I am pronouncing the words and to see if you understand what's what's being read and then you guys will have a chance to pronounce these words and then I hope we can get through it and then we'll talk about it do you guys think this is a, a good idea or not a good idea okay hi everybody my name is Lisa and it's time for another verbling class and in this hour it will be a reading class um, I took an article from the New York Times online and I thought we would read this article and discuss it is about the idea of using some handheld devices to check uh, people's reaction to Broadway musicals or musicals that want to be on Broadway so this topic is interesting in the sense that it is part business so if you are interested in business and marketing and also it's part creative so if you're interested in the ideas of creativity and art musicals acting theater uh, stuff like that then it's really good vocabulary for you if you would like to uh, be able to understand these types of articles and also to be able to uh, discuss them. So I put over here in the Verbling chat uh, the link to a Google document. That's where I have the article. And we are going to read it together. So if you have a reservation for the class, you can go ahead and use that 
now. And if you don't yet have a reservation, I think the reservation button shows up first, so you can click on that, and then you'll be able to uh, join the class with the green button. You just click on Join Class. It costs one ticket, and you can uh, get tickets uh, for three dollars per class, so that's three dollars for an hour-long class, or you can buy a couple of tickets in a package deal, or you can um, be a premium member. So if you want to become a premium member of Verbling, then it's forty-five dollars a month, and that allows you to get um, to take as many classes as you like. So I'm going to give you guys the link here so that everybody can um, see how you get tickets. So there you go. That's how you get tickets. And if you want to uh, uh, use PayPal, you can use PayPal now. If you do not have a credit card, 